Welcome back to another episode of the Meaningful People Podcast. Right? Right? Dude, how are you? How are you, dude? Hecher <laughs> lachatz. Can we make a Momo Bauman doll? Thank you for sharing what's going on in your head there, Nachi. No problem. It's a lot of hecher lachatz. Can we make a word that is hecher and lachatz? Hachatz. Uh, you can brainstorm that out. Anyways, we can make a Momo Bauman doll where you just squeeze his stomach and every Don't time it says- Don't make any dolls, please. It says a different word. Please do not. Like lachatz. Okay. Anyways, uh, this episode is powered by- our big friend, not our big friend. He's not. He's not. He's not big. Our Halig friend. Our Halig friend, Isaac Newman. Uh, this episode of Zechariah Nishmas, his mother, Rechama Paral, Malka Leah, Bas Ari Leib, Neshama Shav and Aliyah. All the inspiration, the chizuk that's derived from this episode should be in Aliyah for the Neshama of her of of his mother. Amen. Um, an amazing Amen. woman. Thank you, Isaac. Yes, and, and family. A big shout out to our friends at ILS Infinity Land Services. You had the honor to meet the CEO. I really did, by the way. Uh, him and his wife, I encountered them at a wedding. A uh, shout out to uh, Yossi Snyder and his wife, Mazel Tov. And uh, it was so geschmack. We were just there on the dance floor. Turns out I know his wife, or I should say his wife knew me from when I was born. Wow. Very close with my oldest sister. And uh, like they were telling me all about like when I was born <laughs> and my childhood, things I never knew. It was fantastic. Like when you were two and a half, you just kept screaming these yeshivish words and like, how does he know these words? Exactly. Like, it came to him from the Malach. And exactly. Shemaya. But yeah, Mark, awesome guy. Um, super humble, super unassuming. Check out Infinity Land Services. I, I mean, you would trust him with your title, right? I absolutely would. Would you trust him with your glasses? I would. So I would trust him with the title then. So make sure to head to ILSTitle.com. That's ILSTitle.com because- I think it's a 20-year anniversary. Yeah. Coming up like this weekend- was the 20 year anniversary of founding Infinity Land Services. So which like, he founded, he told me that he got, Mark, how are you dude? Hey. He, he graduated law school immediately, like in first graduating class following 9-11. Wow. So like the job market in the city was really tough. Right. And he decides he's gonna start a, a title company. And that's what he did. And that's why you need to get in touch with And Mark. took their first meeting with an underwriter while his wife was in the delivery room delivering their child wow we're getting we're getting that's how serious he takes this Jeez. and that's how supportive she is in this project in this endeavor 20 years later how are you talk doing? about no horror stories you're sitting at your closing where's title well title's <laughs> in the delivery room not not he's, an excuse he's here anyways we did an amazing episode this week with rabbi asaf Haimov. this falls under the category of one of those people you maybe have never heard of and we're so excited to bring this episode to you this is a story of a father's journey a journey uh, from, you know, growing through grief, through adversity, someone who had every excuse, has every excuse to to just lay down, you know, keep the blinds closed, to fall into that abyss. But he powered through him and his family. They power through. Um, this episode should be Lezeh uh, his daughter, Efrat, who passed away uh, tragically a couple of years ago. But uh, to sit down with someone like Rabbi Haimov to hear his story, I think... Young, both young and old, the Amuna that he shares is is palpable, and I think it has. It's really uh, wild. Yeah. He, he talks specifically a lot about darkness and the light that is shining through him. I hope it comes through in this episode. But just sitting with him, shaking his hand, being in his in his presence, there's just light everywhere, uh, and it's unbelievable how that light has shone through as he as he's about to tell you through a very dark period. Yes. So you want to uh, give a big thank you to our Behimov. And want to let you know that you should enjoy this episode because it's a really good one. And of course, also, I'm going to answer a lot of the questions that I'm going to get. Yeah. There is no relation to my business partner, Hesky Asaf. Oh, Asaf here is a first name. Right. Hesky's last name is Asaf. We're just, we're just, just trying to clarify yeah. that. These are the FAQs. Right out of the gate. They exactly. call it facts it's like a or proactive FAQs? addressing of the questions. Yes. Hesky Asaf Haimov. So they're not related, but they're not related. They are not related. Interesting. Okay. Um, and we need like five more reviews to make sure that uh -oh. Momo's glasses uh -oh. go bye-bye. So make sure to leave a review on this podcast and out of here. Uh, enjoy this episode, everyone. You are listening to the Meaningful People Podcast. The podcast featuring our nation's most impactful, influential, and meaningful people. It's, it's a pleasure to have you here. Uh, and you are Rabbi Asaf Haimov. Yeah. Yeah. Welcome, Rabbi. That was, that was Thank a, you. That was a strong name. Yes. Asaf. Who are you named after? 
Nobody. I don't know what my parents were thinking. Really? Because we're Sephardi. We name after the living. And now my kids look at me like, who's alive? Abba. Yeah. We, this is what you got to do with our kids now? Name them Asaf? You know, come on. I'm like, guys, bullet stops here. You guys can do whatever you want. I get it. We live in New York. <laughs> Just name I was always the odd Just one. <laughs> I was always the odd one in school. You know, that name Asaf. Everyone's yeah. called by their last name, Friedman, whatever. And I, Oh, Asaf, right. The Sephardi guy. Yeah. But, uh, it's fine. I handled it. Sometimes you pass like a shul and it has like the most interesting name. Correct. I'm not gonna. Na- I'm not gonna say what name because that's probably somebody's name. Exactly. But like the grandparents said, like you don't have to name after me. Just name. Just get, name a institution after but me. But the truth is, the Ashkenazi I think that's girls, girls names are the hardest. hardest. Like base Canada. Like yeah, not the, even- it's only the Ashkenazi. The Ashkenazi girl names are insane. <laughs> yeah, Yenta, Freida, ba, 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 ba. How about the Syrians? It's different. You know, it's a. What yeah, but they, they have the, the, the Syrians from today. They name their daughters Florence. They name their daughters all Americanish names. Kelly. Kelly, all that stuff. But like, you still have normal Flatbush Hever naming their kids. Yenta naming their kids. Uh, 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 Shenda naming their kids names, which, you know, you only find them in the Preiches and, you know, I'm saying it in, in, in some odd troll. But, they, you know, they're still naming those kids their names. But listen, it's it Hashem still the loves them. It's yeah. all good. Yeah. It's great. It's good times. Yeah. Well, I want to I want to sort of level set here. You know, we've been getting quite a bit of feedback from the listen listeners that episodes that feature individuals that would otherwise seem to be ordinary people just walking around but in reality living extraordinary lives, those episodes seem to resonate with the listeners even more than sometimes the well-known figures and Claudia Stroll is so full of incredible people. True. Meaningful people. And a lot of them are well known. We, should name, course, a, we should name a podcast Meaningful People. <laughs> interesting. Let's go on. So, and very often we'll have people that are well known before they tell their story and people recognize them, people know who they are, and they understand, you know, why they're being featured on this particular podcast. Okay. But then in other times we have the opportunity to sit down with someone like you who a lot of people might not know your story and people might pass you on the street and think that you're just another guy walking by. And in reality, what I've come to learn about you uh, from some people that know you is that you've had extraordinary experiences and living today with the type of Amun and the type of Bitochen that is, it's, it's truly aspirational. It's and that's work. why we invited you to, to work. share Thank a little you. with us. It's work. I was forced into it, to be honest. Look, I grew up in yeshiva my whole life. I learned in top yeshivas. Well, okay. I learned in cheder game, being up at chesi yeshiva <laughs> All right. And I deserved it. You know, I deserved it growing up. No problem. I wasn't the best kid in school. I did a lot of trouble. I have a hard time sitting for a long time. And class is boring. The Rebbe's a burnt out guy, Nebuch. And, <laughs> you know, today you have professional Rebbe. I mean, you know, these young guys who, who yeah. go out to be a Rebbe. They, they, this is what you learn for. When I was growing up, I was a Chesisha guy who had no life. I'm saying couldn't do anything in the real world. Oh. So he became a Rebbe. He wants to stay in Lechus Kaj, became a Rebbe. It's like one thing before becoming a Mashgiach Kashras. You know what I'm saying? It's like <laughs> your last shot is being a Rebbe. Okay. And we took a beating or two because, you know, and I always look at Nebuch, you know, I don't blame him. I don't blame him because he gets paid late, Nebuch, from the administration, takes abuse from parents. My son, my son. You know, you know those mothers? <laughs> my son wasn't my mother, trust me. And then, then you have the kid who abuses the Rebbe. You know what I'm saying? It's so like, you know, I'm, but I learned in regular Cheder growing up, and I carried on to South Falls or Yeshiva. I learned there in South Falls. Right? I learned in the top really? Yeshivas. Yeah, yeah. I learned. Right, Bear. Right, Belly Bear. Made the CMI Shas last night at the Shasathon. Mm, yeah. You How did? You? Yeah. Wow. Carried on to Artstrel. I was in the mirror for 10 years. I put in a lot of hours in my learning, and I took myself very seriously. Asmicha, I learned by Berkowitz. Great. And they teach you Betacha, and they teach you Amuna. But how lucky is the person that is forced into it and has the opportunity to create his own vessels to be able to connect with his creator through darkness and through um, uncertainty. And then you get the opportunity to exercise everything you were taught and make it a reality and, and take a, you know, a dark, 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 dark situation and find the light in it. And I was okay to do that. Um, I have let, good, yeah. I have, yeah, go ahead. Let's, let's uh, I guess, for those who don't know what that time in your life was, let's bring people to the beginning of, of what that dark period was. Hi, my name is Asaf. I'm <laughs> it was dark from there? And I know yes. getting named Asaf, you said it was <laughs> trouble. I mean. So 
Um, so I'm 43. All right. And I've done a lot in, in, in my life living in Eretz Israel. I remember I, those, those are good times. All right. Mm-hmm. Where, you know, I was able to learn in Kolel by our Berkowitz. I remember, or in the mirror, you know, I started in the mirror, Karen or Berkowitz best years, right? Everything coming to you. Um, you don't need much money to live in Eretz Israel. I was very active, a lot of energy, and I've done a lot of wonderful things at a young age. But, um, no but, wait. Mm. And we started a shul there, and we, we bought in Sephardic families to, to Ramad Ashkol. I bought there when it was completely, like, you know, unheard of to do. But I needed space, and it was a minute away from San Nigeria and it Made sense to buy, and we bought there. We moved in family, started a shul. Life was great. Life is great. But there was something missing there, you know, and I realized that something was missing there is when I moved to New York to start a Kiev organization and things were going good. I was working hard, bringing people together, teaching them Tyra. And then you find yourself on one bright day, one bright day, you know, a doctor knocks on the door and breaks the news to you. That it's a Shabbos day. Shabbos day. I'm having lunch at home with my family. I have Kenai a lot. I have seven kids at the time I had. Um, sitting on the Shabbos table. My daughter wasn't feeling good for a few weeks. You know, we were running her for tests. This and then the first thing I mean, it's got to be cancer. The doctor said, no, it's not cancer. It's just a cyst. She had a big bump that grew in her head. It's just a cyst. We're going to remove it. We already had a specialist lined up. The specialist saw it. He's like, I'm not touching this. You know, it's bigger than what I expected. Let's do blood work, this and that. We did blood work Friday morning. Shabbos morning, literally, I get a knock on the door. Doctor tells me that your daughter um, is looks like she has leukemia. I read the report, and it says their findings are, you know, one hundred percent leukemia. That's 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 you know that's that's pretty much what the report said. And then your whole life in one second mm. becomes completely blank. And you know, I remember telling the doctor, okay. How long do I have to get to the hospital? It goes to me, you have an hour and a half, tops two. She's got to be on, she needs support. She needs blood, you know, or hemoglobin, everything. You know, everything's low and she really needs blood. I said, okay, thank you. He left the house. I came back to the table, continued singing, continued eating. I have sons. Why should they, you know, I have family. Why should they feel like, you know, something's, and my daughter had no clue about this conversation. I mean, she knew something's up, but she had no clue the news. Can I ask, did, sure. did you have a relationship with this doctor that he was coming to your house to yeah, knock on the yeah, door? Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's like, our kid's oh, pediatrician. That's pretty amazing that he came yeah, to you. He's a kid's pediatrician. He told you, you know, he's like, you got to go. You, it's 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 a, it's a doctor from the community. He's like, you, you really got to go. And um, and I remember going back to the meal. We benched. I sent everyone upstairs, called out Sally, went to the hospital. And that's the day my life changed forever. You know, I get to the hospital. I don't know what to do with the emotions. I don't know what to do with the news. It hits you in one shot. It's not like you don't even prepare for it. Like it all comes to you in one shot. Even though you said that you had felt that. I knew something was up. You knew that. It, you, you, you said prior that you knew right away it's cancer, but even hearing it. Right. I knew it was cancer and they said, no, it's not. It can't be this and that. I'm like, okay, fine. But in back of my mind, I knew something's up. Something's wrong. Something's off. Now, I'm tell you leukemia, there's a hundred levels in leukemia. You know right. what I'm saying? There's ALL, there's AML. I studied it. No, some very curable, right? Some, most of them are curable. Happens to be she got the one which is very hard to cure. All right, AML it's called. All right. How old is she at this time? On her sixteenth birthday. This is on her 16th. on her sixteenth birthday. That's correct. Right. Um, well, day before her birthday. Excuse me. It was Shabbos. Her birthday was on Monday. Sorry, two days before. And I remember we got to the hospital, and then your life completely changes. And she was sick three times. Not why she got better. After six months of chemotherapy, she got better. We went to the summer, I remember, you know, and, you know, when, when you're about to lose a life, it's like when you're about to lose something and all of a sudden it changes mm-hmm. and then you get it back, your appreciation towards that is completely different. Like all of a sudden there's a new meaning to life. Yeah. And I remember we went up, uh, we went to Tom's River that summer when it was still affordable you know, I was able to rent a place for, for like two months and like it was cheaper than staying in Brooklyn. I'm like, okay, great. But now people leave Lakewood and move back to Brooklyn because they can't afford to live in Lakewood. So they move back to Brooklyn. <laughs> Five years ago, whatever, three years ago, was people couldn't afford to stay in Brooklyn and move to Lakewood. They had no money. You know what I'm saying? That's all the way around. You know what I'm yeah. saying? 
oh, I can't afford a private jet, like a, a pod, you know, <laughs> to land mail. Okay, I'm going to move back to Brooklyn and yeah, buy you a had million a, house. You had a meat platter on Chavez, I'm sure. What's that? You had a, you had a charcuterie board on Chavez. Yeah, it? of course. We're smarty, man. <laughs> Bronius. You know, but uh, uh, nothing less than kibbe and lachamajin on our table. You know what I'm saying? I'm going to cook all that for the shul. For the, for the... You don't do cook no, that we have in shul. My wife, if I book a go home, she'll kasha the whole kitchen. Oh, that no, we got about disgust it. Oh, yeah. She'll kasha the kitchen, the whole thing. <laughs> you kill, she'll spray the whole thing. And about, she'll, oh, I was going to say what about Pesach? On Pesach, you guys are eating rice. Yeah, yeah, we have pure, that's why we do slichas for thirty pita, days. Pita. <laughs> <laughs> we have hummus, falafel. You guys, uh, you know, nebuch gebrux, and you're busy with that stuff. Yeah, <laughs> we're feasting, baby. Sushi. You, know, you can't take food away from a sfardi. Is, like, is, like is there a sfardi Pesach hotel? No, that wouldn't work. Why? It wouldn't work. As sfardim stay home. Really? They stay with their families. Yeah, they don't leave their family for nothing. It wouldn't work. Okay. Um, <laughs> I guess well, let's get back. <laughs> yeah, let's get back. So, so, um, so we were in Tom's River. I remember, and I was like every day busy with my daughter, taking her around, buying her whatever she wanted. You know what I'm saying? We got a life back. And she was yeah. a very hush of a girl. My kids were born there. My older kids. My wife literally was born in Meisharim. You know, I married oh, really? your Shami girl straight off, straight out of your slime. <laughs> Gula. I met my wife in Gula. And I, you like know, Shidduch, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was in the mirror. My dear <laughs> was two minutes away. I'm <laughs> eating kugel. Uh, but eating garinim Friday night <laughs> yeah. on the street, right, by the bus stop. But uh, in any event, so, like, you know, my kids are very special. My The ones, you know, the, at the time, they were all little. When she got six, she was the oldest, 16. Now, can I know, you know, the kids are older. This was three, four years ago. But um, in the end of the day, I remember looking at her with a whole new appreciation to life. You know, she's, she made it. Yeah, and I remember going to Shul Rosh Hashanah, and I said, "Hashem, I want to give myself more to Klal Yisrael because you gave us life back, and I want to give the rest of my life to Klal Yisrael. I want to help reach out to Klal Yisrael and use all my energy to perfect Hashem's world, to make Hashem's world a better world." I remember, I'm davening, I'm dying, I'm crying, tears of joy, not knowing that as I'm davening, my daughter's sick all over again because we went the next day for a visit to the hospital, and they ran tests, and like, sorry to break the news to you, you know, your daughter just relapsed, and. Oy. And now we have to change course of action. Now we have established the chemo didn't work. And I remember sitting and looking at the doctor, and you don't understand. It's like you got your life back. You appreciate it so much. And then he just breaks the news to you that your daughter is sick again. That was harder than the first time. But yeah, could you, could you take us through sort of the emotions of hearing that the second time? I was looking at him and I was like, I was frozen. I said, You said we're going backwards now. You know, I looked at him and I said, I remember saying, Hashem. What is it? What is it that you want from me? What is it the? And this is what I want to get at. You know, why am I sharing with you that she got sick, sick three times? You know, she, well, let's talk about the second time. All right. The first time, let's go back, excuse me, to the first time. The first time she got sick, I remember not handling it too well. And I was experiencing anger. And I remember I flew to Michelstadt in, in Germany to dive by the cave of the Baal Shem. And I knew that. One of the Gedele and Varad were going to be there at the time. So I went specifically to see him there. Reb Mordechai Gross. And he was there. And to I, the Baal Shem Tov? Uh, to the Baal Shem. It's called the Baal Shem from Michelstadt. Oh. And um, it's a famous caver. And I, I, he was there and I went over to him. And Who I, is that? I'm sorry to ask. He was a chassidish rebbe. A chassidish rebbe was known to bring a lot of Yeshua. No, not the Baal Shem Tov. No, not the Baal Shem. The Baal Shem, the Baal Shem from Michelstadt. And uh, Pardon he, my ignorance. He, no, he was no, he's known to bring Yeshua's. I, I was introduced to this caver through a friend of mine who went there a few times and found Yeshua's. So I said, I'll go. He paid for my ticket. He took me actually. And we went. And I remember meeting with Mordechai Gross and I was like being so angry. I said, gosh, I'm do this to me. And why to my daughter? Her whole body's in pain and she's infused with leukemia when she never sinned in her entire life. And you know, I was like, I was, and I, I remember saying, okay, I'm going to take full control of the situation and I'm going to get to the best doctors, best everything. And after a month of having this attitude, I became completely exhausted. Like burnt out. I got burnt out and I realized, what are you trying to control? The cancer is not your nisayon. The cancer is a reality. It's real. The cancer is something which is between her and her creator. This has nothing to do with you. Stop trying to be a hero. Stop with your ego. Stop trying to take control. This has nothing to do with you. And I learned this the second time. The second time when the doctor broke the news to me, I remember saying, Hashem, I accept. I, I, I completely accept. If this is your will, then this is going to be my will. I accept what you're doing. I accept that this is the best thing for her. I don't know how, but I know that this is chesed because that's how I was trained to think. 
And I'm not going to sit do the same mistake I did the first time. And that is to try to control and try to be on my game and then get exhausted and get emotional. This has nothing to do with me. This is between you and this is between her. My job, my Nisayan, is how I'm going to cope and how I'm going to deal with the situation. And I've realized something super interesting that in my darkest moments, in the dark and the dark and the dark of moments when the doctors were like, you know, she may not live. And I remember, you know, let me jump real quick. You know, we did the bone marrow and she got better. My oldest daughter, my second to oldest daughter was her donor oh, and, wow. and it went great. And it was 10 out of 10. And I remember, and I asked her. What was that conversation with your second daughter? Yeah. Like? Great question. I remember the conversation with my, uh, you know, when, when the doctor said, we have to bring all your kids in. I'm going to run a swab to see if we can find a donor from the family. That's usually best. You have a lot, you have a lot of kids, no? I have seven at the time I had seven children, seven children. Okay. So we take all the kids to the doctor and they're swabbing everyone. And two out of the seven, two out of the six kids were a candidate. My oldest daughter, well, second oldest daughter. And at the time, my youngest daughter. And I remember that they were fighting between them. Who's going to be the one to do it. Wow. How, how was, the, was the, the youngest? The youngest was seven at the time. Wow. And my oldest was uh, 15 at the time, a year apart. And I remember they were fighting between the two. Who's going to be the one to do it? And the doctor chose the older one because the closer in age, it's better because adult blood is better than the kid's blood. It's more refined and whatever. Perfect. And I remember that they were arguing who's going to do it. And when the older one got this to do it, she felt so good about it. She came to the hospital. It's, 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 Painful, also, no? it's, it's, it's an experience. Yeah, it's, it's not so simple. You know, they put you to sleep. It's, you're in the hospital for a few days. Like two days she was there. And it was a very emotional time. And I was so proud of her for fighting who's going to do it as opposed to saying, I'm going to do it and I don't want to do it. And, you know, until we select on the country, they're fighting who's going to do it. And I remember a, a, a close friend of Efrat, the last Shalom, was in the hospital at the same time fighting for her life, but she, something went wrong there. And she ended up, she had ALL, which is a lot easier leukemia to deal with, but she relapsed in a very aggressive way. And she was in the ER at the time in the ICU, excuse me, on a different floor. And I was asking Efrat while she was getting her bone marrow transplant, I said, what are you davening? What are you saying? She's like, I'm davening for Sharon to get her a full wow. You know, while she was getting infused new life, she was davening for the other girl who was dying, you know, and the girl Nebuch passed away a few weeks later. And I was looking at this. This is my daughter. What a hush of a girl. That's what's on her mind right. is what's going on with the other girl upstairs. I'm going to daven for her instead of davening for herself. Beautiful. So she did the bone marrow and she got better. And then we went home. It was COVID. It was Pesach time. And we went home and we were home literally. It was no shul, no nothing. And I remember I said, wow, Hashem, twice. We got life back twice. It was the best state I've had in my life. It was just my kids. No guests were there. I felt like a true Ben Chayrin. I wore my nicest suit with a vest. And I'm <laughs> a guy who cannot be like, you know, I need my button open. This and that. I wore a hush of a vest, you know, a hush of a suit. I, fi I found my nicest suit from my closet. I was thin because I ate nothing in the hospital. You're wearing a nice suit now also. It's a, a, a weekday jacket from down the block. But in any event, <laughs> in Portland, I got 80, up to 80% off. But uh, but uh, I know I'm being here tonight. No, I'm kidding. But uh, I remember I wore my nicest suit with a vest. I sat the whole seder with a vest. Arba Kaisis, not a drop, went on my shirt. I was a true Ben Chayrin that night. I was... Nobody gets near me tonight. I'm a Ben Chayer. And, you know, I was sipping on the wine. I had the best Seder. I was up till three o'clock in the morning with my kids doing the Seder. I have older teenage boys. It was the best Seder ever. My daughter's home. She came back from death twice. We saw kids dying every week in the hospital. And you know you're probably next. You know, it was a disaster. It was dark. It was super dark. But I'm going to get to my point in a minute. And I remember sitting there at Pesach. I said, wow, look, this got her life back. And all of a sudden, she started to not feel well again. Before she starts not feeling well again, yeah. I, I, I want to highlight the roller coaster that you're describing, especially after having the experience of recovery and then, as you mentioned, relapse. Mm -hmm. I imagine, I project that it's difficult in and of itself to get excited by the victory because of the fear, pending fear Correct. of what will be. The so, fact that you experience that Seder as a Ben Chayrin and that you were so besimcha. How do you allow yourself to do that? Uh, so I'll tell you what, so I'll tell you how that works in a moment. Look, I, let me, I'm going to get to my punchline, which will answer your question. I remember sitting there with Pesach Seder, I'm besimcha. 
and I said, I'm going to enjoy the moment. One thing you're taught in the hospital is, you see, most of us are trained to think big. You know, all you guys are entrepreneurs. It doesn't cost money to think big. If you're already going to think, think huge, right? And that's what I thought my whole life. Pretty much I did everything on my own. I, you know, I, I worked for myself. I started a shul in Israel for myself. You know, I was 23. I was a kid. But in the hospital, you you are forced to live with a new Metzius, And that is, can I make it to the night? I cannot live anymore, you know, think ahead. Because when you think ahead, death is somewhere. Right. You can't think there. about weddings. and. Are you kidding me? Yeah. I'm lucky if I get to go home with her in a wheelchair. And, and, and oh, then what's going to happen? Who's going to marry her? <sighs> is she going to die? So in order not to lose my mind and to, and to deal with that anxiety, I've learned that, can I make it to the night? Tomorrow's a new day. If I could just make it to the night, I'm a lucky man. So you're celebrating the small victories. Exactly. And then there are days... I said to myself, can I make it to the afternoon? It's the, it's the one day at a time. And and sometimes it's an hour at a time. Like the and sometimes I'll think about the story with the sniper with the five minutes with the coat that he left it on the tree and every five minutes, another five minutes, another five minutes till he made it to the morning. You know, like when you're in the gym and you're pushing that last mile. And okay, can I make it to the last mile? Can I make Okay, you know what? I did. Let me try another one. Let me push for another one. Small victory. It's like you said. I saw once from uh, Rabbi Dr. Abraham J. Tversky. Mm -hmm. Zecher Tzadik. Yeah, Lavracha. for sure. He he wrote once that uh, Yaakov Avinu, when he was working for his father-in-law to become his father-in-law, working for Lavan, and he worked for seven years thinking he was working to marry Rachel. He got the wrong one. Ended up marrying Leah. Married Mrs. Wrong. Then he, <laughs> then he worked another seven years. And the Pusik says that it was Kiyamim Achadim. Correct. And it went like a couple of days out of his love for her. And he asked the obvious question, you would think if you're anticipating something and and you're yearning and this love is driving you this this outcome, it would take it would feel like an eternity. Correct. So what does the pasuk mean? Kiyamim achadim. So Rabbi Abraham J. Tversky, he writes that kiyamim achadim means singular days, mm -hmm. one day at a time. Correct. It's the only way. The only way to get there. Able Otherwise, to you lose your mind. Endure. It seems like eternity. You could go crazy, and that explains the Yosef Yeah. And that explains a lot of other legends out there. I, and, and I adapted that new lifestyle. I said, I'm going to live it for the day. I'm going to live for the day. I'm going to try to make it to the evening. And then we'll worry about tomorrow, tomorrow. You know, but I'm going to make it to the evening. And I remember that after Pesach, um, we were home and she started, her, her number started to go down again. And we hopped some things up. And then we went to the hospital right after Pesach for a normal visit. And then the doctor did a test again. And that's when he broke the news to us that your daughter relapsed the third time whatever, a, a second time, which is her third time being sick. And it was a completely different, you know, completely different experience than we have to have a meeting and this and that. And all the doctors are member on Zoom. And I'm sitting there with my daughter. My wife was not allowed in the hospital because Andrew Como doesn't let more than two people in the hospital at the same time. Mm. So the sick patient, only a parent. They're about to break the news to us, but oh, my wife wasn't allowed to be there. So there was a big screen, me and my daughter, a few doctors, and then the main doctor is on the screen. And the doctor starts a conversation by saying, your chances for long-term survival are close to zero. You're not going to live. Mm -hmm. And you have two choices. Or you go home and enjoy quality of life. In other words, live out your next few weeks, months, whatever it is with your family. Or you could stay here and we could try our best to try all these novel drugs on you and you know maybe 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 something will work, but... You know, none of these FDA medicines usually they don't work. Non improved right. many omega, they don't work, but they're new medications and maybe you can contribute to society so we can learn what doesn't work. And Efrat is getting this information at the She's same time. She's sitting right there are. with us. Yeah, how's she processing wow. that? So I asked her, Efrat, what do you do with this information? Listen to how a hush of a pure girl talks. She goes, Abba, you remember when we were sitting here? I I'm the one who spent all the time with her in the hospital. You remember when you told me the Vart was sorry, Menu? I said, which Vart? The Ramban's Vart. When the Malach came and said, you can have a baby next year, right? So Sarah laughed. She laughed. She looked at her stomach. She said, can this stomach bear a baby? I'm all wrinkled. I'm an old woman, right? She, she looked at her chest. She said, can I nurse babies? I, I'm an old woman. I, I can't give life to another. I, can, I can't give over to, another, uh, to, to a fetus. I, I'm 90 years old. There's no way I'm having kids. 
So she left. So everybody says, how could sorry me to laugh? Where, you know, what's her bitachon, right? So Ramban says, I don't get it. I believe it's the Ramban. I don't get it. Um, what was she? Well, she's not an idiot. I'm saying, what was she supposed to do? I'm saying, you know, if imagine I come to your house, Chashom, you're missing a leg. God forbid. And I say, I give you a bracha the next year you should run the marathon. Thanks for the dinner. I laugh. <laughs> You would get insulted. You'd probably beat me up, right? If you were able to. Why? Because well, I'm, red- like. I'm a redhead? Yeah, no. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, but it's not it's not a sensitive thing to say to somebody. It's like a little showboating. It's like... What are you yeah. saying? Yeah, right. Okay? You're telling an old woman, Nebuch, who probably suffered her whole life knowing that she can't have kids, and now you're rubbing in her face. Next year, she have a baby boy. Shana Abba Ben Zachar. That's what you tell a woman who's, who's grieving Nebuch, that she can, she's 90, she's on a wheelchair. How exactly is she having a baby? Right. So she left. Because she chapped, the guy's not making sense. And she she knows, she's not an Arab, she's not an Arab, she's not a Malach. Urban says, the taina is not that she laughed. The taina is what triggered her to laugh. She looked at her stomach and she said, can this stomach have a baby? It's not natural for me to have a baby. And for that, she laughed. Hashem said, that's the taina. We say every day, Hashem could change nature. Hashem could. Hashem changes nature every single day. Yeah. Sarah is so hung up with nature. That she can't believe that Hashem could change nature if Hashem wants to. And for that, she was held accountable. And she turned around to me and she said, Ah, but naturally I'm not making it. But they don't have the last word. Hashem could change nature at any given moment. And that's what's going to keep me going. And that was her initial response. And that was her last conversation on earth was a question she called my Rebbe, Rebbe Walken. She called him up. She said, Rebbe, what's my avodah for Rosh Hashanah? This was two days before she died. She goes, I can't read from a Mauser because I lost my vision due to all the medication and, and the infections and the chemo and whatever. I can't walk to shul because I'm in bed. I'm, I'm, I'm disabled. I can't, I can't walk and get out of bed. Which to that, he answered, yeah, but to fight. That's all you can do. And then she completely like shut down and died literally the next day, two days later, on past day on Wednesday. This conversation on Monday, past day on Wednesday, and she got buried in Eretz Shal on Erev Rosh Hashanah, Erev Shabbos, you know, after Chatzais. And I looked at her and I said, this is how this girl left this world. What? Wow. And I remember at that period when the doctor broke that news to me till she passed through, it was five months. And that was the darkest time for me because- Those five months. Those five months. Because the doctors, especially the last, I would say six weeks of her life, five weeks of her life, the doctors were already telling us that, look, there's infections coming and this one, that one. And we're just, we, we're, we're out of, we're out of luck. We just, you know, we're out of ideas. We just don't know how to battle this. And now is the time to ask you, how do you want to prepare for her death? And they sat me down one day and, and they were telling me, um, in a room full of psychologists and doctors, and they were breaking the news to me that, you know, chance are it's any day now. And do you want us to put on a respirator? Do you want us to pull the plug? Do you want us to just let her die? And I'm sitting there and I'm like looking at all of them. I'm like, people right now are are making choices what kind of steak they want to eat, right? Yeah. Or what kind of suit they want to wear. That's their choice. And my choice right now is to select how I want my daughter to leave this world. And I remember I worked very hard on myself those five months. I remember the last time she got sick, I said, Hashem, the first time, I was angry. Second time, I accepted. This time around, I'm thanking you. Now that I know she's not going to make it, I want to thank you, Hashem, for giving me such a schus to be able to raise such a beautiful girl. And you're going to take her back from me exactly the way you want her. And nobody was able to do the job better except my wife and I. I'm humbled that I was selected to raise and polish this neshama, which is yours. It's not even mine. I'm just a messenger to polish this neshama, to return her to you exactly the way you want it. And I thank you for giving me the opportunity to be able to be Kadeshim Shemaim. Because what I've learned those few weeks, those few months in the hospital, that even at the darkest time, even in the darkest and darkest of darkest time, when I was having this conversation with the doctors, that was the darkest period. I remember I walked out of the room and I vomited in a garbage can. I just vomited. And I said to myself at the time when it just could, it was just one thing after the next that was going wrong. And I said, Asaf, even at this time, you still have free will. So how are you going to look ahead now? Are you going to approach the situation? 
and find a light and find a way to connect Hashem through this situation by thanking Him, by becoming bigger, by creating vessels to accept Hashem's bracha. Because if you continue thanking Him, you will get bracha. Because there's no level of bitach in which you can pretty much uh, 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 vocalize than by saying thank you to Hashem when everything's going wrong. By saying thank you to Hashem in a situation like this, you're saying, this is pure chesed, what you're doing with me. And even though I don't understand it, I'm thankful for it because I know that this is the greatest thing that could be happening for me right now and my family. Do I approach it or do I avoid it and start victimizing myself, saying, Nebuch mm -hmm. me. What a Nebuch. Hashem, why would you do this to me? You don't like me. And then become a victim and live with a victim mentality. Which would be understandable. Which will be understandable was an option. Why not? Because when you start going that way, you realize that you're buying into the darkness as opposed to finding the light. Let me tell you something. Big light's not going to come to you during the daytime. What's the point of having a big light during the daytime? It does absolutely nothing for you. Your light comes and every person's light comes through his darkness. The light, the darkness is, is the seba of the R. And that's what we're taught. And that's how he started this conversation. You know, growing up in Yeshiva, we were taught this, but I never really internalized it. I never really worked on it because I didn't have to. Life was great. I was doing tremendous things with everything going good in my way. I've learned there in Sloan Kettering, in the death ward, literally kids were getting into bags every day and being rolled out of the hospital. Kids who we knew, families who we knew, and you know you're next. You're just waiting for the angel of death. You're just waiting your turn. You know you're next. It's... It's like those chickens in the caparis thing, you know, and, yeah. and you see it in the, uh, you see those chickens in the, in the thing, you know, they're getting slaughtered. Okay, it's not as vicious, but you know, you know, you're next. You just don't know when, how, and there's no preparing for death. You don't know how it's going to come and get you. But I remember that when she passed away, I remember I was looking at her and I said, this girl went from being in the greatest pain in the world to being in the greatest place in the world in a split second. And I remember then saying to Hashem, Thank you so much for, for allowing me to deliver. And I remember Rabbi Walken taught me when I told him, Rabbi, what am I supposed to do? These are the doctors are saying, I, I don't know how to cope with it. He said, just say thank you and you will see unbelievable schism. I said, I can't say something I don't believe. He says, just start talking it and you'll believe what you're saying. Eventually you will believe it because it's, it's what you put out. It's what you put out. It's, it's it's what you attract. I want to highlight this particular aspect of it because as people hear you describing this mindset, it is so otherworldly to people that are sitting in their pain. And for someone that is stuck in the chayshech of their darkness, it's almost it's unfathomable to adopt this type of mentality. And this tool that you're offering from Rabbi Walken, I think, is is very instrumental. It, it's an instrument to emerge from the darkness through like faking it until we make it. That that's it's a secular term, but this tool that you're offering is so critical in taking that first step out of the darkness. So you see, you said a good point. Just touch on your point. I'm not Breslov. All right, I'm not going to put this out there. I'm not Breslov. I'm Sfardi. I follow. So our, you had you know. the pass on the Ryamaka, no? <laughs> no, I'm not Breslov, but. I got very attached to, you know, their way of teaching in the hospital because they teach you to have bitachan and bipasimcha. I mean, be sign happy. me up, yeah. right? <clears throat> you see, therapy teaches you how to make sense of the darkness. I don't have time for that, all right? You're not going to make sense out of someone who's dying. It doesn't, it doesn't add up. Chasidus teaches you, what can I do? Where's the opportunity in the darkness? I don't get it, and I'm never going to get it, and that's fine. And that's what Amuna teaches you. You're not going to get If everything made sense, then where is my schar? If everything makes sense, where is my free will? I want free will. You cannot live a moment without free will. So I understood that even in the darkness of the dark of the dark, I still have free will. And I exercise my free will, and today I'm the happiest man in the world. I'm going to jump real quick and tell you what I earned in it as a result for accepting that pain not trying to figure out why it's happening because I'm not a therapist and no one's going to be able to tell me why it happened except Hashem. And one day when Mashiach comes in my lifetime, I'll start laughing. Mm -hmm. I'll understand why. Or 
if I'm not Zaychet to Mashiach, when I'm out of this world, Hashem will tell me why he did what he had to do, but I know I'm going to get an explanation one day, one, one time or another. Be it here or be it there, I'm going to get an explanation. And I'm not with any anxiety whatsoever to have an explanation. I don't need an explanation. I'll get one one day because that's extra credit. I need to know that I'm servicing my career. That's all I care about. Because in the end of the day, what's my life worth with everything I've been through if I don't have God part of my life? And I'll explain to you what I mean. If I had no faith, I would be in major depression today. If I had no connection to Hashem, when I say Shalai Gai today, it's a completely different meaning. Completely. I don't understand how Gaim go through what I went through and they go back to work. There's a guy whose daughter died literally a week before me and he was crying and I gave him a hug, Nebuch, a Spanish guy. I told him, so what happens to you now? He goes to me, I'm going to work tomorrow, nine o'clock in the morning, he's got to yeah. be at work. What a Nebuch. She's going to dump the body in, in, in some cemetery and just go to work. You know, a shtickle funeral in the morning and then he's got to go to work. Shiva is mama she, like. It's a Jewish thing. Yeah. And I and I remember saying, like, I don't know how Gayim, what kayak do they have? Like, for me, I was on such a high. And, uh, you know, I, I was so connected. And I said to Hashem, Hashem, I love you all day. Thank you, Hashem. I love you, Hashem. Thank you so much for believing in me. Thank you for giving me purpose in this world. I remember when she died. It was Arab Rosh Hashanah when she got buried. And I remember going to Shul. And I stood in front of Hashem Mincha time, literally an hour after she was buried. And so you couldn't even sit Shiva. I didn't sit Shiva. No, I sat oh. Shiva for one day actually. Um, and I was, she was buried on Friday morning Israel time. Uh, Friday afternoon Israel time, one o'clock, which was f- f- like Friday morning five a.m. by us. So I sat just Thursday, Friday. I didn't really sit. Put on fill in, but I remember going to Shul and I said Hashem. I stand in front of you today knowing I did my tough kid this year. Half the world, Drezach's around. They don't know what they're born. They don't know what they're doing in this planet. A guy runs to Uman saying, that's where Hashem wants me to rush on. Who says? A guy runs to the Kaisal, leaves his family. This is Hashem wants you to run. Who says? But I know that every Shabbos, I dam this in the hospital room next to my daughter. And I read from a Chumash, the parasha, and I leaned to my daughter when she was sleeping. She didn't hear what I was saying. But I had three, four hours to myself. I stood there and I was crying on the ninth floor looking in the Shemaim. I said, I feel today like it's Ne'ila time in Yom Kippur because today I'm serving you exactly where you want me to be on the ninth floor in Sloan Kettering. No better feeling in the world knowing that you're servicing your creator exactly the way he wants you to serve him. I am fulfilling Ritzan Hashem. And the greatest feeling to walk around with, the greatest security a human being, a from human being can have is knowing that he's servicing his creator, that he's fulfilling his task that he was born to do. And I remember standing on Russian Yom Kippur and I said, I have no fear today. If you took my life today, I know I'm going straight to Gan Eden. Today, I have no fear. I feel so connected to you that I, I have such a level of love towards you, Hashem, that I'm beyond the fear level. What should I be afraid of? I saw the angel of death. I, I know what you're capable of. I know what you're capable of, Hashem. I've seen it. I've seen your wrath. And yet, I feel so close to you. I The only thing I'm afraid of is that next year at this time, I'm going to have to start clapping al again for Chatan, which I'm really going to be doing. Now when I'm saying al Lefanecha, Behir Aroim, or al Chatan Lefanecha that we ran after Arias, running after Arias, I was stuck in a hospital for for almost two and a half years. What running after Arias? What running to speak Lashon Hara? What, what Lashon Hara? I didn't speak. I, I spoke to the wall. So I, who would I speak to? So I know that none of these al apply to me this year. My fear is can I stand next year in front of you, Rosh Hashanah Hashem, next year and feeling the same thing? And let me tell you what a year I had. Because I was blessed to be able to hop the opportunity to find my light in the darkness, to, cr- to, cr- to be, learn how to cope with the darkness mm-hmm. and find a way to find the light in the greatest darkness, not to make it make sense, because it doesn't make sense, but to what am I going to do with that darkness? How am I going to cope with that darkness? What am I going to do with that darkness? And I decided I'm going to thank Hashem for it. My daughter died. I said, Hashem, I don't have a taina that she's not living for another 60 years. I have a car satayv that you gave me here for 18 years. When you talk that way and you make a kid Hashem, and those are the words I spoke at her funeral, and those are the sh- classes and the programs which I've been running and giving classes on to a lot of bereaving parents and a lot of parents who are in pain who are losing children. I connected with them and I told them, just say thank you. I'm telling you it's going to work like a charm. Just say mizmer letayda. A hundred times a day. Walk around saying Bismarck Taida. David Amelech's life was 
bitter as can be. Think about his life. King of Israel, living like a gypsy in Midbar Yehuda, running away from his father-in-law. And finally, he gets the kingdom because his father dies. Then he's running away from his son, his wives, his, his everything crashed. His family members, his brothers didn't remember much of him. And yet what? He wrote Mizmar Lutaida. He wrote Hallelujah. He wrote Chiramalis. His whole Sefer Tehillim is his baidus between him and his creator. He found greatness through his sufferings. And because of that, he was able to be the greatest man of all men in, 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 through his sufferings. The greatest king that ever lived was David HaMelech. We all have that opportunity to connect in our level like David HaMelech connected on his level. And when I did that, I was Zoha to Abnol Abracha. I remember my daughter passed away. Uh, Rosh Hashanah, my wife gave birth exactly 30 days later to my baby boy on her Shloshim. Now for Svartim, a boy is a big deal. Mm. All right, on her Shloshim. Just Svartim? Huh? Just Svartim? And Hasidim. Ashkenazim, they're okay. Well, girl, wow, big parties. Us girls, we don't even bring them home. Yeah, we, we look for adoption. How much? No, I'll pay you. Just take her. I didn't, I didn't say that. He said it. I'm just kidding. But Only I remember, can go at other Sardim. <laughs> I remember I was in the hospital and I'm looking at my son and, I said, and my wife was connected to the same machines my daughter was connected to when she took her last breaths. And my wife was, I knew how to run the machine. I didn't even need a nurse. I knew how to control it. Because, you know, I was Dr. doing that for two years. Dr. Asaf, yeah. Nurse. <laughs> and I remember I was like dealing with my wife and, and the same machines my daughter was connected to till she took her last breath. Well, my wife was connected to 30 days later and only like, you know, bringing life to the world. And I remember when she gave birth to the boy on her shleishim, on the same period of time, shkia time, my son was born, shkia time as my daughter died. And I remember I was like, wow, what are the chances on her Shleishim to give birth to a baby boy? Uh, right after Sukkot, it was huge. I remember, and I was like at his breast looking at him. I said, how am I going to support this kid? How am I going to, you know, I have no job. I have nothing. I'm like. You just spent the last couple of years in the hospital. Yeah, yeah. I have nothing. Uh, and now you got to jump back into society. You know, when you're in the hospital, you have no choice but to be on your game. You got to be on your game. You got to, you know, because I have to answer to my daughter. So I got to be on my game. There's no room for, you know, there, 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 there's no room for, 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 for opting out because then I'm inadequate, you know, and I, I don't want to be that guy. I want to be good, good for my daughter. But after your daughter dies and after you're thrown back in the side, after everyone to you, now you, you know, you got to, it's like. Got to show up. Yeah. No, I'm like, now what? Everyone, like all of a sudden you, you know, you're back, you're thrown, you don't do it yourself. You know, you're back in the world and like. Now I could fall into depression and nobody would even care and nobody would even know uh, I'm, I'm back, you know, I'm back in society. That was the hardest time. And I remember at that point I said, Hashem, I'm going to fight. I'm going to stay close to you. Hashem, thank you so much for giving me so much life, for giving me beautiful son who was just born. My whole attitude towards my family changed. I remember I looked at my three sons. When my daughter got sick, I said, who's going to learn tire with them? At the time, it was a 16-year-old, a 13-year-old, and an 11-year-old. So who's going to learn tire with them? Chasheva boys, you know, they're very stark boys. Who's going to learn tire with them? I would pay any money at 15 years old to get my father out of my life. You know, think about it, you know. Uh, my father used to leave for business or, you know, excuse me, he would go to Art Stroll for a Yeti Yeshiva, for <laughs> Kenneth's, all those things. And I would say, well, yes, he's gone. He's going to Art Stroll. Now I have two weeks to myself. So I remember. <laughs> Okay, it, uh, I'm going to do shtick in yeshiva. It took two days to get kicked out, right? Because you do it the first day, they give you a pass. You do it again the next day, and I had all strategy. And I said, I have to choose the greatest trouble because to get kicked out right away. Was this no is warning. in Fallsburg? No, this is before Fallsburg. I was in high school. Yeah. I know why the listeners like the non-famous guests, by the way, because of your <laughs> candor. <laughs> <laughs> all right. The, the famous people have too much at stake. Yeah. Nah, <laughs> I'm speaking straight from the heart. I remember I got kicked out of yeshiva, and I had two weeks to myself. Did whatever I had to do. And I came home with my father. I called him home. Give me a patch. Put me in my place. But I deserved <laughs> it. I deserved it. You know, it was worth it though. The price to pay. So I said, well, what's going to be with my sons though? And I remember getting out of the hospital. I'm after the shiv, after the shlesha. I'm looking at my sons and they're staggering away. And I said, you know what? I'm going to stay away from them. I don't, <laughs> don't want to ruin this working. You know, these kids are, they're on fire. And today the Kenai are the finishing Masechtas one after the next. Today they're two years older, all of them. And, and, and my oldest son now is almost 18. The other one's 16. The other one's 14, turning 14. These guys are staying away and, and can are what a nachas, you know, and, and, and the fact that I had the choice of falling into depression, getting into that victim mode again, you know, or fighting to live like a hero and look at myself as a person who now created tremendous vessels to be able to receive bracha from Hashem. And guess what happened? I received unbelievable brachas from Hashem. We made a campaign. We raised money to get her a safe attire. I remember that was her wish. 
and Make a Wish Foundation. That was her wish. She wants a uh, safe attire. So, so Make a Wish Foundation. The Make a Wish Foundation came yeah, to your they daughter. They came to her and they and they gave it to her. They said okay. I remember it was a, it was a little of a fight because they're like, we never heard of such a wish before. And I remember I, I I had a sales pitch with the lady. I said, look, let me tell you why this is worth it for your organization. Why? I said, I know this is unheard of, but like, if you send us to South Africa, let's say, and, to, and you put us up in a five-star hotel and we, you send us to the safari, we get to see all the animals in the Jeep. The recipient, the 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 patient gets maybe 10% of the gift and we the family gets the other 90. You know, we're a big family here. You yeah. know what I'm saying? We're, we're, <laughs> we're nine people, you know? But if you get her the Torah, we're all out. You know, she's the only one who's benefiting from it. I get nothing for it. You know, I'd rather go take the trip, but that's what she wants. And isn't it about her? They said, we like that. You know, let's, wow. let me speak to my uh, supervisor. When the supervisor uh, approved it because of that, you know, Sara. And um, we got a sofa and everything. And then we started to write the Torah. But when she passed away, like they pulled up, they pulled the card, which I didn't care. It's Geisha money anyway. No problem. They, they said, <laughs> fine. So I said, you know, I'm going to make a campaign. Remember, I put a campaign together. We went, we went online and 36 hours, we were able to raise the money we needed. We raised like way over what we were expecting. We raised like, what was it? Like $750,000 we raised, 730. I forgot the number. It was over $700,000. It was two years ago. Mikam Yisrael. Yeah, Mikam Yisrael. I remember a night before the campaign, a close friend of mine tells me, what are you doing? Get off this campaign. It doesn't make any sense. You're going you're gonna to flop. Nobody cares really. Everybody moved on. Why would you do this campaign? Is you gonna you gonna look stupid? This and that. I remember Sounds like thinking, a really good friend. I was, no, he's like I'm telling you because I love you. You learned a big lesson <laughs> because I love you. Listen to this. I thought to myself, so wait a minute. If this doesn't work out, I'm not I'm not the one who looks stupid. This is about the Tibor. and yeah. this is about the people on my door. I have nothing to do with this. You know what I'm saying? If 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 we come up short, they look stupid. Not not what's that do with me? It's nothing to do with me. It's what they feel towards her. And I remember we did the campaign and it was a success. And I remember I texted the guy at 10 or 1 p.m. It was over at 10. And we raised the money and all the ribbons and great. Mm. And I sent him a screenshot and I said, I just want to thank you. You taught me a tremendous lesson today. And I'm not trying to stick it to you. But you taught me a lesson today. And that is, you know, it's so important to hear everything from people tell you. Hear it. You don't always have to listen. Mm -hmm. If I would have listened to you, I would have left been zero right now in the bank. Wow. Zero. Okay. I took that money, first hundred grand, and when I bought a gorgeous Sparty safe attire. Beautiful. So fair, wrote it up. Gorgeous silver cover. It weighs like, you know, you don't need a gym subscription. <laughs> weighs, yeah. You do Agbo with that, you, 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 you yeah. know, you, you your veins are popping. You're flexing. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> a gorgeous silver, heavy, safe attire. I spent a hundred grand on the tire and the cover. Okay. I made a fest, a mamish, a hush of a meal on her first year yard site with the safe attire, with the Achron safe attire on her yard site. I remember just looking at Shemayim. It was Arav I was going to Arav for a yard site. And I remember looking at her and I said, ah, frat, we did it. We did it. And this is how I'm honoring you on your first yard site, dancing in the streets. I was crying. I was, I, was, I was so high. I loved it. And we took that money and we started a base medicine in memory. And with so many good things, I'm working, can I know? I started a shul. I'm teaching Tyra. We're in contract to purchase a place. All this in a short period of time. Short yeah. period of time. And my life has completely turned around to the good. Wow. Because, because of the darkness. Right. In other words, Hashem it. was looking to give me good. But you're not ready to receive that good. You have to be. A you don't vessel, have the vessels. Yeah. Imagine we won the lottery now, five billion dollars. We won it. All of a sudden, your wife's not so pretty. All of a sudden, your kids aren't so cute. All of a sudden, everything around you doesn't mean much because now you have five billion dollars. You can do whatever you want, right? You can buy Ferraris. You can go live in Vegas, live like a king, right? That's a guy you think. What would I do if I won five billion dollars? I wouldn't know how to deal with it. I, first, you have to learn how to deal with the hundred, a thousand, ten thousand, hundred thousand, half a million, million, hundred million, billion. And then you can work with $5 billion. Yeah, I, I, I don't have the vessels to deal with $5 billion. Hashem has a mind for every human being to become the greatest he can become. If Hashem waits for you to do it, sometimes we'll go through a whole life without that happening. Hashem has a plan for me. I don't know what it is. I said, I got to bring this guy to understand what he's capable of. So, and this is all of us, by the way. So the darker you find yourself in, the more you know you can end up doing one day. Because... The darker your situation is, the greater the light's going to be yeah. when you get out of it. You well, just have to learn how to deal with it yeah. in the moment of darkness. I want to ask you, <laughs> I'm getting these vibes, and I'm sure maybe some of our listeners are too. You come across as this like powerhouse guy, rah, rah, make you laugh, make you cry, you know, but you got, you got energy. Um, the loss of a child is probably, you know, 
They say is one of the most unimaginable. Doesn't most get worse. Painful loss. Doesn't get harder. That, right? Doesn't get harder. Was there was there a moment, um, maybe right after Efra passed <laughs> away that you got sapped of all that energy and you broke down? Are you kidding just, me? Plenty. Plenty of times. And I remember at times when I was driving in my car crying, broken. I'm a broken man. By the way, I'm speaking to you right now and I'm a broken man. I'm never going to cure. I'm never going to be, you know, forgetting that pain. But the question is, what do you do with that pain? Are you going to turn that pain into purpose and do big things with that pain? Or are you going to mope for the rest of your life? It's not an option. I, I can't handle depression. I can't handle sad. I'm not that guy. By the way, many people go through what I go through and they keep it between the family. They keep it all inside. I can't, I can't deal with toxicity. My cure is to speak it out, is to deal with parents who are going through it. I remember when the whole thing Surfside happened, I reached out to families I didn't even know. I introduced myself. Many slammed the phone on me. And he carried a conversation with me. Many people, most people who slammed the phone on me reached out back to me and said, okay, I'm ready to hear you now. You know, and I said, and I get you slammed the phone on me. I'll slam the phone on you too if I didn't know you and <laughs> you're calling me. And I'm right now in pain. I, I don't know where my child is. And you're calling me to tell me Hashem runs the world and Hashem loves me. Are you out of your mind? Like, and I, I completely got it because I was that guy also when I didn't know how to cope with the pain. The only Mila I see of suffering so long the way I did in the hospital is that it gives you the time to get in touch with yourself. So it's very dark there in Sloan Kettering. It's not a fun place. It's no picnic there, let me tell you. But you see Jews at their greatest in the hospital. You see these organizations that, that really mean you're good. You see other Jews there for other Jews. You see people come. You see a lot of things that you don't see anywhere else. You see it in the hospital. I will never forget my experience that I've been through. The pain which I carry with me every day, I use it to help Klal Yisrael. I use it to to grow. I use it as 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 a tool to be able to stay connected with my creator. I understand people's pain. I understand people's needs. I uh, could feel when 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 a person is missing something in their life. I understand depression. I understand sadness. I I could I could deal with all that now because I've suffered. And I still suffer. Right. It doesn't mean my life's over. On the contrary, my life just began. My life began at 40 years old. My my life began because my daughter gave me the tools I need by her leaving this world, the tools I need to become the greatest you and me I can become. And every day I ask myself, are you the greatest you can be today? There's no such thing, oh, I can't do it. You don't want to do it. No such thing, I can't. You could. You just don't want to. We'll be right back to this episode in just a second. Right back. But first, right back. I, why don't I see it coming? Like every time, I really like I get tripped up every time. Every time. We'll be right back to this episode. Right back. Right back. I, I'm trying to like look over my shoulder like a quarterback on the pressure. You don't have to look over the shoulder. It's coming. It's I coming every lachans. time. I feel lachans. Anyways, Moshe Alpert, uh, you you know you're you're sitting there with your wife. You're, you're over your kitchen table. You're like, I don't get it. You know, we're making solid money, but we're kind of in the red, you know, we have like this credit card debt. We have this, we have that. Like, why are we not living more financially like free? Why are we so tied down? And that's at the point where you guys should just like say, you know what? Let's call Moshe. You call Moshe Alpert and he comes and he deals with, okay, listen, you need to make a financial plan. This is what you need to do every month, every day. You have this fund, that fund. There, there are many, many things that you can be doing better when it comes to your finances by reaching out to Moshe Alpert. So go ahead and send him an email at alpertmoshe at gmail.com or give him a call, 718-644-1594. And right now, as you're hearing this and you're experiencing that little ping of, uh, this is what happens to me when I hear these types of things, I get like this little ping of anxiety. It's like ping. Right. And it's like, uh-oh. But like Moshe is there to like help you through that Indian. Indian. It's 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 a very important Indian. Indian. As we know. Yeah. It's a very important topic. Indian. Indian's very much my Indian, you know. It that? is. Yeah. It's, it's Nagaya. It's Nega. very it's very important to have a guide through this Indian. And Moshe is inviting everyone to let him be your guide. Listen, man, I'm talking to you guys. Don't think you're macho if you just deal with your finances yourself. It's not as Leave your ego by the door and get help for it so you could actually drive that Maserati that you've been hoping to drive. Erroneous. Or that Erroneous. Hybrid, or that hybrid, like, uh, what's that car called? The Prius. Yes. Yes, it's also a nice car. Um, but anyways, reach out to Moshe Alpert and get started on that path and enjoy the rest of this episode. 
I want to highlight a theme that I, I noticed in, in a few pivotal moments when you were faced with a challenge. You you used you seem to use a, a, a similar tool, um, specifically when you had naysayers about the campaign and going back as well earlier in, in the journey where you were struggling with the, the challenge of the initial diagnosis. And in both of those instances, you removed yourself from the equation. And with your daughter's diagnosis, you said, this is not about me. Correct. This is about your challenge. Correct. Your diagnosis with your creator. Correct. And when it came to whether the campaign is going to f- fail again, you, you picked up the same tool and you said, this is not going to be my failure. This is going to be the Zebra's failure Correct. if they don't fund 100%. this campaign. Can you elaborate on that tool where that where that is rooted? Just eliminating yourself from the Okay, equation. so let me tell you the best thing that happened to me in the hospital, the best, the best thing that happened to me throughout everything is that Hashem forced me to crush my ego. Mm-hmm. And I'll tell you what happened. I found myself with no income. I found myself struggling to pay bills and it was also COVID broke out. So I'm not alone now. The whole society now is in trouble. And but I said, okay, I... I have no way to make money. I'm stuck in a hospital. So a very, 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 very hush of organization re- reached out to me, Sephardic Korcholim, SBH. And the head of it, the CEO of it, met with me and he, and he right away, you know, he took a liking to the story, to myself. He understood that I'm not one of these deadbeat guys who are just looking to take their money. He saw, you know, my accomplishments and everything. He looked at me up online and whatever, you know. I, he said, okay, you're, you're, you're a serious guy, you know. We want to help you. We want to help your family. And he said, he wrote their checks. He wrote out checks. This is going to be for your mortgage. This is going to be for your tuition. This is going to be for your cars and this and that. Tell me your expenses. So I committed to give me a month, thousands of dollars a month. All right, I think the number was like 10 grand maybe or eight grand a month. I said, okay, thank you, thank you, thank you. And I remember I got very close with him. And about two, three months goes by and he calls me. I was like, Asaf, come to my house. I used to go to his house like once every other week, whatever. When I was able to get to the hospital, I'd go sit, just give him an update where I'm holding and what's going on in my life and whatever. He cares for me. I barely know him, but we got close through Efrat. So I go to his house. He's a hot editor guy, Sephardi guy. And he, he starts losing it. He's screaming and yelling at me and like, are you all right? I'm like, well, what's going on? I said, you know, and, ah! I said, okay, you talk and I'm going to listen and then I'm going to talk and you're going to listen. He's going on, on, on. He goes, I'm like, what's your problem? He goes to me, why aren't you catching my checks? Well, my money's not green. You know, he's a smarty guy. He's got a temper. <laughs> well, my money's not green. Well, you think, well, blah, 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 blah. you can't catch my checks. Well, you think, blah, blah. So I told him, oh, that's what this is about. He goes to me, yeah, that's what it's about. So I said, I'll tell you why I didn't catch your checks. I thought about it. But the reason why I didn't catch it, because I felt that there's people in your organization that could use it more than me. I'll manage. He goes to me, you believe what you're saying? I said, yeah. He goes to me, you're full of garbage. I said, <laughs> what do you mean? He goes to me, you know your problems. I'm going to talk to you straight. You know, you speak every words. I'm going to tell you your problems. All right, you listen to me. All right, I know what I'm talking about. He goes, you have an ego. That's your problem. You have an ego and you cannot accept the fact that you need help. This is what Hashem wants you to work on right now. He wants you to break. Because you found yourself in this situation. You didn't call it. You're not drugs. You're not on drugs. You're not using your family's money in Vegas. You are forced to not work. And you're a capable guy. So you're, But you're forced right now not to work. So what is Hashem telling you? Be machnia. Yeah. Be machnia. You're not ready to accept that. Wow. You have an ego. And I remember I looked at him and I started to cry. That was the, his bigger contribution. And, and I said, you. you know what? I said... You just taught me a big lesson today. We as humans can never take fault. We can never ask someone for directions. The four ways, right? <laughs> we can never, we can never take fault. We always have to be right. I said, I'm gonna catch you money tomorrow morning. I stood in Bank of America at nine o'clock in the morning. I was crying. I said, I'm I raised hundreds of thousands of dollars throughout my life for different organizations in Claudia Israel. I started my own thing in Israel. I started a very successful show in Ramadish call. Okay. I raised money for Kyla guys throughout my whole period of, of time living in Eretz Yisrael for Mir guys and stuff like that. I was close to the right people in the Mir Shiva. I'm involved with a lot of good stuckers, always raising money. And here I am now taking money. I said, Hashem, 
I feel so good right now because it's so hard for me to do this. I feel so good to do this now because I know it's so hard for me to do. This is the best thing I can be doing right now. I'm doing your will. I'm going to break my ego. And I put the money in the bank and I was using his money. And one thing I've learned there is the second you live with no ego, you have the greatest life in the world because <clears throat> it's never about you anymore. It's never, ever, ever about you. I live my life. Guy cut me off. Cut me off. Guy took my parking spot. I took my, I live in Brooklyn. You know, these are big mm. things. <laughs> hey, I took my parking took my parking spot. No problem. Nothing ticks me off. Nothing ticks me off because it's never about me anymore. You want some potato go-go? <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's not about me. You know, a, a guy gets under your skin. Okay. Trust me. I'm no saint. All right. But in the end of the day, that element of living with, it's not about you. And, you know, it's okay to be wrong. And you don't look, it's not nothing. There's no shame when you need something from somebody. It's the greatest life in the world. Look at little kids. They don't have ego issues. They're the happiest kids in the world. They, they could fight and pull their hair and they, they could scratch each other. Three minutes later, they're playing all over again. Why? Because they're not looking to be right. They're looking to be happy. Yeah, grudge is not something that Adults, exists, yeah. oh, you said this to me. How are you talking? <laughs> I'm not going to talk to him. I don't years. have those problems. <laughs> yeah, I don't have those problems. I, I don't have, not because I'm a saint. I was forced. And for that, I'm so thankful to Hashem that he, I, hopefully this is once in a lifetime opportunity. I hope I don't have to go through this ever again. And I hope no Jews should have to go through what I've been through. It's the worst thing to go through. I won't say worst, excuse me. It's the hardest thing to go through. Mm. But it's rewarding because I am a completely different person today. I am happier with my daughter's death than I was before she passed away because now there's meaning in my life. Now I feel like I'm, I, you know, I, I, my life right now has tremendous meaning. I stood in front of Hashem the next Roshan and I said, I did fulfill your will. Out of a hospital, but I fulfilled your will. I raised money for my daughter and I did the right thing for Efra. I started a base medrash. I'm teaching Tyra to the public. What else do you want from me? I'm using all the time you've given me to make money for my family and to be able to feed my children, go learn with my children's second Seder in Yeshiva, Okay, when I'm running a business, a brand new business. But Hashem is giving me such bracha in the business that I could hire four men and other people to run the business so I could go learn Tyre with my children, second Seder. At four o'clock in the afternoon, I'm already in the base matters. I'm teaching till nine o'clock in the morning from six o'clock till nine o'clock in the morning. I'm, and I'm learning from four and on and I give Chabur as a night Seder. So I'm working maybe five hours a day, six hours a day. And I'm making more money in the last two years working five, six hours a day than I made 10 years before combined. Wow. Without a business card. And nice. without promotions, you won't find me in any online. Uh, I, I don't go to all these events. Maybe I should. We might mm -hmm. find you on Meaningful People podcast. <laughs> yeah. It's awesome. It's but, awesome. But, but I don't, I don't, you won't find me. Maybe I should go to all these shows and stuff, you know, and put I think myself you're good out here. there. You don't have to go. But <laughs> there's one going on right now. And no, you're here, ooh, so. baby. <laughs> right? But I don't, I don't do it. I don't do it. Maybe I should. I, you know, when you do the right thing and when you live besimcha and you live being, say, thank you to Hashem all day, the bracha comes to you. Yeah. You don't have to go out for it. I want to invite you to, to share from the perspective of tefillah a little bit. Before doing that, I want to be Malamet's chus on Sarah Imenu. You mentioned her laughing. Right. In her predicament when she was told the news that she's going to have a child. I heard from, in the name of the Ishbitzer that the laugh was rooted in the Indian of tefillah. We know that tefillah is a tool to activate shefa. Correct. When a person davens, it, it, something can be destined for that person, but without that tefillah... Doesn't unlock. Doesn't unlock, doesn't unleash activate it. the shefa. So, and that person's avoida is to do that. Correct. And so, what Sora was laughing about, I heard the Ishbitzer explained... Which of course she believed that the Abishar can be Mishana the Teva, Hashem can change the nature. And uh, Sari Menu understood and believed and knew that she could, of course, have a child if that was the will of her creator. But what she laughed about was she didn't believe that it would be the result of her Avoida. Mm -hmm. She had given up on her Avoida to effectuate that outcome. Correct. If Avram was going to daven for her, if something, some other force would bring that down. Of course, the Eberster can make that happen. She just felt that she wasn't the right result tool. of her avoida. That was laughable to her. Got it. 
And what the Abishah revealed was that, no, it could be your child. It could be the result. It could be you. Don't ever give up on yourself. True. Correct. That being said, it's just, it was on my mind to be Mulamad's chus for sorry, right. Menu, um, ever since you mentioned it. But all that being said, where was tefillah in your journey? So that's what you're taught. When I started diving the words of the first bracha of Amida of Shmon Asrei, Mechak Chaim Bechesed. How many people focus on that? Mechak Chaim Bechesed. Mechak Chaim somebody's life right here, she's on a respirator. Your health is chesed from Hashem. Mechag al-chayim b'chesed. Mechayim esim, which we never saw, but now it's on my mind. Berachim rabim, soymech naiflim, berafi cholim, matir asurim. You think about the words you're saying. Melech memes umchaye umatzmiach Yeshua. Hashem is in full control. Melech memes umchaye Two opposites. Um, Yeshua. And that same God can bring you Yeshua at any given moment. If you just believe in it, it's going to come. And that's, I started talking to Hashem like that all day. And I'm driving in my car and I'm just saying, in English, praising my creator. Saying, Hashem, I'm, a, I'm in love with you. Uh, uh, you've, you've carried me through this. I never understood how, you know, Jews can go through, a, you know, a situation and not question their creator. I, I was taking a haircut the other day. And the guy was like, Ah, I have a problem with God because my wife is so mean to me. She's a narcissist now. She doesn't let me see the kids. How can Hashem do this to me? Blah, 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 blah. So I dropped religion. So I told him, you were obviously never religious if you dropped religion. And I said, do me a favor. You're just looking for an excuse to live your lifestyle. And you're blaming it on, 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 on God. But in other words, you're telling me that faith doesn't exist in your book. Where does Even Gayim, Lahavdil, it's fake, but there is such a concept of faith and faith and I don't know what, but you know what I'm saying? They don't have a bunch shalom, but like, you know, but there's something called faith, you know, these preachers, faith, you have the faith. Ah. You are uh, hysterical, by the way. You know, I'm but, not kidding. Now I'm trying to watch my speech here because I know it's, you know, on the oh, internet, but if, if the thing was off, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> but in the end of the day, you know, faith, what? Faith. You have zero faith. It's, it's a diva, about taiva, it's eight no problem. But, you know, like, I could have lived, I could have been that person. I told him, you, you, you don't suffer like I do, man. All right. <laughs> Your suffering gets nowhere near because you you could change a situation because they're all alive. There's nothing I can do, all right? But what I could do is use the light, which I have right now, use the momentum, which I got right now because I gave Shevach Veda to my creator and do tremendous things in her memory. So in, in my world, she never really passed away. In other words, mm -hmm. yeah, she's not here next to me breathing, but her legacy is being carried on because I'm using my strength now, which Hashem has given me, to do the right things for her. Mm -hmm. I could have been right now, laying down in bed, staring at the ceiling, uh, drooling coming out of the side of my mouth, on medication, you know, looking for 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 purpose of life, being in depression, and rightfully so. Right. All right, and rightfully so. But that was not an option. And guess what? Hashem didn't let me even take, think of going down that path for too long. All mm -hmm. right, because. All of a sudden, I had to start getting on my game for, I have a big family. Can I know now, can I know we have another, two kids were born since my daughter's illness. You know, we're, we're can I know with her, 10 children. Yeah, so I'm on my game. You know, there's no, there's no, you know what I'm saying? There's no, do I think about her every single day? Does my wife think about her every single day? Can I look at pictures of her? Yes, I could. Can I see videos of her? It's a little hard, but yes, I could. But when I look at her, I'm happy for her. I say, someone asked me, how much money would you pay to bring your daughter back to this world. I looked at him for selfish reasons, all the money in the world, and I wouldn't stop till I got the number. But why, I, why would I do that to her? If I believe that she's in Gan Eden, which I'd rather do, if I do believe that she's not in pain or not suffering anymore, why would I want to bring her down to this world for a shtunk in a place and, and do what? It's a very mature, it's a very mature answer. Wow. No, and do what? What? Okay, I bought her now. Why would I do that to her? If I love my daughter, which I do, and I believe in Gan Eden, which I do, why would I take her out of the, out of Ziva Shechina? She's sitting there with Miriam and Avia, Sarah, Rachel, Rivka, Leah, all the Imais. Bring her down to this world, back and being a hamster on, on a wheel, not knowing which direction you're going, only to die again. Like, what, what's the point of that? I dive in the one day I should be Zeichet to be where she is. You know what I'm saying? That's, yeah. that's, that's my tefillah. You know what I'm saying? It's like, you know, imagine Chashal, we're living in 1941, and we're, we're loaded on cattle cars and we, and, and, but we, 
it, it, you know, we're going with our family in Nebuch, we, know, we don't know where, but we were matzlich to get our oldest child out of the ghetto and send her to Palestine to some Yershami guy's house, some big guddles taking care of our daughter. We would, we would be somewhat happy knowing that at least one of them is 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 going to have a normal upbringing and it's going to be in the safe haven. Lahav de lahav de lahav de, that's what it's like. You know what I'm saying? We're in, we think we have it good, but compared to El Mab, there's nothing to compare, right? She, netzach netzachim, she'll be being nene for ziva shechina. And you can't compare all the taivas and all the greatness of this world. That's what it talks about, barichos. Doesn't even compare it to, 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 to naivin dana. The, uh, the, uh, the Kairas Ruach. Kairas Ruach. That's the Sprach. The Kairas Ruach means you pass by a bakery, you smell the Geshmach of bread, right? That's not even the Taiva. <laughs> That's just the smell of the Taiva. And you're already going high, right? Pa- Mafia to Angel. You ever pass by near Shlaim on a fast day? Oh, <laughs> baby. Right? Yeah, it's, and I used to be an overweight guy. I would go in there on a fast day. They'd by make the way, good that, money that day. You that know what I'm o, saying? That oh, baby is from my walk. That walk is right. Walk is saying. That's right. <laughs> that is right. So I would pass by Mafia to Angel. Forget it. You know, uh, fasting. Tiny Hester, bring it on. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Filling up bags with Ruggalach, this and that, big guy. You know? But uh, that's a Kairos Ruach. All, all of the types of this world, Kairos Ruach. So why would I want to bring it here? For, yeah. for what purpose? It takes a certain mentality, a certain mental state of mind to be able to live like that. Now, I'm no, I'm no big shot. I'm no, you know, uh, no hero. This was the only path which I was willing to take. I did not want, I, I can't live with that. It's, I, it's not for me. I don't want to sit in front of a therapist uh, on the couch, just, you know, just, whatever. You know, I, 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 I might have to find a better therapist, by the yeah. way. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I, I made insert, it my business. therapist ad. <laughs> yeah. I made it my business to be able to uh, get in touch with, with the reality of things and, 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 and find the light in the greatest darkness. And, and, you know, and if you look good enough, you'll find it. The last question as we wind this down that I have for you is if your daughter, uh, Efrat Alva Shalom, was, was sitting here right now in front of you tonight, what would you, what would you say to her? Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you for, uh, because she, she, the truth is she is the one because you see, uh, like uh, sometimes we got to up our game because we married a certain woman mm-hmm. or we have in-laws we have to answer to. Right or your parents, you have to answer to, or yeah, you know, whatever it is. She made me up my game by leaving this world. So her death is tragic, but the upside is, is that she, my daughter was mizake, mizake me. Usually, a father's mizake his child. Right, my daughter was is so big that she was mizake me to get lit up and do the things I'm doing. And committing to live the rest of my life this way, it's like Hashem is forcing me to up my game. You know what I'm saying? Like, you know, our shul had abnormal tzlacha from inception. Like, I remember I was I started on erev perm, tightness Esther. I was stapling in the laminated floor into the ground, saying that we're starting Kriyas Megillah here in 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 a half hour. Literally, it was four o'clock, four or whatever. Starting mincha. And I didn't know if it was going to take off. I said, I'll give Bakery's it a shot. Bakery's wafting in. Yeah. What? Bakery's wafting in. Yeah, the yeah, yeah. That's how you make you a know, show but, successful. Uh, yeah. Sesame, donuts, I had it all laid out. <laughs> you know, and I remember stapling it on the floor with the with the guy there. We were doing it, the guy who was installing it. I was helping him, setting up tables and chairs. I said, let's see if this takes off. I don't know. I'm 100,000 in the construction. Let's see if it takes off. Temporary floor until the hush of a floor comes in. Eight months later, Whatever now, ten months later, we're writing contract to buy our our our, our show. Amazing, you know, and 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 the success has went from zero to a hundred, and 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 I did nothing for it. I didn't advertise. I didn't call anyone to come. Come down with us, Kishmak. We put out good food. Mm. That's a given. You know, no kugel. No, no, no the kugel and shul. Now, kugel and now shul. you go upstairs. You get by the Ashkenazim. They come down for us for all the kibbe <laughs> and all the maza stuff. You know, but we put out good homey chant, harif, good stuff. <laughs> You know, we put out good food, and most importantly, we run good, successful kids programs and, and a lot of learning, a lot of Torah taking place. And that bought the people. Yeah. And, and, and now we're like, what, 60, 70 families in. We just started, literally, and we're Amazing. buying a place, all that. And I did nothing for it. Again, it's bracha coming, and it's like Hashem is like forcing me, literally, to up the game. You know, and, and oh, that's okay. That's good for me. Yeah. And it's all because of Efrat. You know, so I, I owe her that tremendous Akara Satov 
that my whole family, we were all up to our game. My sons are staying away in her schus because everyone, like, it turned to the good for everyone. I was so afraid I was going to deal with therapy for years, never each kid, this and that. We all did therapy as much as we needed it. A few weeks here, a few weeks there. We got through it the way we needed it. And, and, you know, my therapy pretty much was my Rebbe who I have in my life. And, you know, I, I went, ran everything by him. And my kids, whoever they, you know, the, the boys, Baruch Hashem, I have, you know, the Rebbe and Yeshiva, the girls, a few of them sat for a bit, whatever. But the point is, my wife and I, all the kids, we all took a right turn. And it's all because of Ephrat. Look what one human being can do to the whole family. Amazing. You know, through death. Yeah. In other words, it's not like the person has to be here to keep on rates and so on. Go, go for it. You can do it. You can do it. None of that. She's not talking. Right, she's she's not here. I'm sure she's pulling some strings for you guys. Oh, that's a hunch. That's what I was gonna say. It's obviously the Sia the Shemaya is coming because she's behind it all. Because otherwise, it doesn't make any sense. Yeah. You know, and and you know, like oh, you are not afraid of Ein What Ein Are you kidding me? I earned this. You know, I I earned this by making my Creator happy, by doing the right thing. A bracha. Anyone could earn this. I'm not a gifted guy. People love to talk about their success. Oh, I did this move. I did, I did, no, I did zero moves. Just get off LinkedIn. That's my story. Just get off LinkedIn. You'll yeah, be like, okay. I, I did zero <laughs> moves. Nothing. I, I don't I don't promote. I don't, oh, every big Vier loves to say his story. Put him right in this chair. Talk till your ears chew, chew it off. <laughs> I did this and I did that. Blah, 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 blah. I did nothing. Zero. I don't have a business card. I did absolutely. I go to work in a suit say and tie. That, say it to that camera. Say <laughs> I did nothing. I did zero. Absolutely. All I did was pray to my creator. It's all I did. Pray to my creator. <laughs> I, I did what a return Hashem as much as I was able to. I was honest with myself, hard on myself. I need to be hard on myself per, to perfect myself, to become a bigger and better person. And that's it. That's the secret. That's all she wrote. That's it. That's it. Rebbe. Yeah. Thank you. Oh, yeah, <laughs> Saf, thank you so much for, for joining us. and Thank you so much for this opportunity. I was able to uh, give any message over. The only message I would love to give over is that if I can do it, it's the only, and I, I, I know that I could do it. Hashem forced me to do it because I was in tremendous darkness. If you're married to somebody that doesn't treat you right, or if Nebuch, you need children, or if your parents is not going good, or whatever your darkness may be, remember that that darkness is your light. That dark, you can find Hashem there. Hashem is waiting for you to unwrap the, the gift, which is darkness, to get the light. And that's the gift. The gift, the matana, is the light. But that light's only going to come because of the darkness. For someone who does not identify as Breslev, that That's is correct. the closest paraphrase that I've ever heard to Rabbi Nachman who says, That's right. It's only there. The song says, uh, yeah, but yeah, the, yeah, the, yeah, the words yeah, of Rabbi Nachman yeah. is, Hashem right. is That's correct. That's where Hashem is enclosed in that darkness. You, you can, can, is right, in, in times of concealment, exactly. And that's you're going to find your creator. You're not going to find him when things are going good. Everyone could say thank you to Hashem when things are going good. Let's see you thinking Hashem when things aren't going the way you want. You're going to go around now showing that you have that level of Amuna. Hashem is going to come through for you. You know, tremendous Rashi in this week's parasha. Dabra al b'nei Yisrael ve'iso. Why are you crying to me? Now's not time to daven. It seems like you're giving up. Do something. What am I supposed to do? I should say, I don't know what to do. He said, go in the water, but it's not natural. Hashem says, I have no choice but to do the unnatural thing because Nachshon is doing the unnatural thing. When a person does something which is against nature because of his creator, Hashem has no choice but to do something against his nature for his creatures. That's how it works. The way you act down here is the way exactly Hashem acts up there. When you show the Yabitachon, when you show that you're doing things unnaturally because the moment is calling for that, Hashem is going to do the same thing in return. And this applies not just to me, this applies to everybody. I couldn't have been more thankful to my creator for allowing me to see that light. And if I could live with this for the rest of my life, I'll be the luckiest man in the world. One day at a time. One day at a time. <laughs> Thank you so it. much. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Meaningful People Podcast. Uh, wow. What a guest. There's there's so much that we were able to get to with every high There's also probably a lot that we didn't get to. Yeah, yeah. You know, from from connecting with him and people that know him previously, prior to us sitting down here in the studio, you know, he, he kept on referring to darkness and that the period was a period of darkness and how the light shines through the darkness. And just to add some context to that, there were stretches of time in the hospital towards the end of his daughter's life where they could not have one ounce of light 
in the room. So much so where phones were not allowed to be on because of how painfully disturbing the light was. For her, yeah. And sitting in that room day after day, week after week, in utter darkness. I think that's that's the context that you heard Rabbi Haimov sharing from. Yeah, and it's and it's really it's an it's a lesson that you know everyone can take from this episode. Whatever you're dealing with, it doesn't have to be. It shouldn't be the loss of a child. None of us should ever know that pain. But it could be whatever struggle you're going through. You can apply many of the many of the principles that that he spoke about in this episode. Um, we were very very excited to sit down with him and and to give his story. He he exhibits a lot of strength, a lot of strength. And I, and I made sure to ask him like, well, are there moments where you broke down? He said, of course, there are moments of him that he was broken. He is a he and he said, I am a broken man, you know. But sometimes those broken parts is where the light can shine through. Right. right? So that is this week's episode of Meaningful People. I'm so happy for you to join us and listen. Um, if you have a suggestion of a guest you want us to have, just make sure to send us an email at meaningfulpeoplepodcast at gmail.com. We'll make sure to get back to you about that email. Uh, if you have any contact information for that guest you're suggesting, we're always open to featuring someone new on this podcast. And stay tuned for next week. Another podcast is coming your way. Shocker. Right? <laughs> We're taking five weeks off. That's it. <laughs> Anyways, we'll see you guys next week. Adios. Hope you enjoyed this video from Meaningful Minute. We have so much more content for you. You may like this. You may like this. Take your pick. Let us know what you think.